everyone, what is A&M's... Uh, I don't like the way this starts. Let's do it again. Sorry. Cut. <laughs> Actually, keep it. Just keep it. I, I like it better. I like it better when there's mistakes. Yeah, this is the hey, YouTube. Uh, it's, it's the Texags uh, Rewind it's brought to you by T-Mobile. And I'm asking everybody, what's the next step for Texas A&M football? Obviously, a national championship sounds good, but what's the next realistic step is it 10 wins every year is it a national championship i want to hear from you because jimbo talked yesterday at the touchdown club and he said consistency, consistency. there you go and these are the and i agree show with guys you. can you just tell everybody who you are i'm kelly fan show. matt brown it's a fan show good job matt <laughs> <laughs> deer in the headlights i'm roy Hi, fighting roy. texas aggie class of 15. kelly adams fighting texas aggie class of 2002. matt browning <laughs> Gig him. Hey, Gig Rock, him. Rockdale, Rockdale High School class of 1997. Get it. Uh, hey, so this, on the show, this is what we had. We had uh, the fan show. These guys talked about all things Aggie sports. Love that. Aaron Torres talked about NIL. Uh, we got uh, rail guards that were, are needed. Schlossed on the series with uh, South Carolina coming up. Looking forward to that one. And the go hour, we did what we talked about right here. Uh, Jimbo Fisher there at the Houston Touchdown Club. All that and more on the Tex Ags. Show. Rewind. No. God, this has been a disaster. Here it comes. <laughs> College football needs a colonoscopy. Yeah, they do. You know, there's there's some cancers out there. You got to college football out. or college athletics. Well, you know what? You're right. College athletics, college athletics. But get uh, I focus mainly on college football. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're, it's weird because it's not like to the brink of they're going to lose viewers and like, but it's just it's just closely be, not becoming college football. And people who talk about it becoming a semi-pro league or a, a minor league to the NFL, then it's not college football. Well, what's, here's the, one, the, the thing that I'm most concerned about is when – it's not when a guy wants to transfer, okay? A guy gets to a point, hey, I need to transfer again. I'm all for uh, – the DeAndre uh, Jacksons and uh, Baylor Cup and all those guys having that you know, having that freedom, but when it gets to the point where Pittsburgh has developed a really good receiver who could be a first round draft choice, maybe the best wide receiver in football, maybe, and then all the things that they've done, they've provided this guy, they they've invested in this guy, and now. Uh, the teams go after him. He doesn't say, oh, I think I need to go into the transfer portal because I'm not playing. It's because, okay, now I'm going to sell myself to the highest bidder, and you even wonder whose idea it was. Right. Maybe it was his. Maybe it was somebody from USC. Maybe he has an agent, and it was the agent shopping. And so I think that's the thing that is, is most concerning – is that uh, you get to a point where players just decide to leave. Now, you know what? They've been doing that for years, but they've done it from – it's a little bit different. It's been like a Hunter Goodwin at A&M Kingsville and realize, wait a minute. Right. I'm better than this league, so I'm going to step up. Yeah, I, I think the big issue, though, is – who is driving the bus and who's making these changes? If it's the boosters making it happen, if it's college coaches getting in, slipping into the DMs before they're allowed to, and are a kid already knowing where he's going to go. Um, I'll read this, uh, this text from Dave and Temple on the A&B text line. Gene Smith, Ohio State AD, the same dude that wanted, the co wanted college football canceled during COVID madness. Yeah, listen to this genius. He got his team in. I'm not saying that... I. I'm going to follow Gene Smith anywhere. I'm saying that there's a lot of administrators and coaches like Jimbo Fisher that are all now saying, They're, hold on, this is the Wild West. We need to fix it somehow. It doesn't mean don't pay the players. It doesn't mean not have transfers. It means we need to have some kind of reform so it does not get way out of hand in, in the direction it's going. Yeah, and I'm sure he isn't saying something that hasn't been approved through his president and mm -hmm. chancellor and all those things. Um, but you know, I've been saying for years that eventually the the major conferences are going to break off. Yep. And I think this is a a tremor that's that's showing that you know the 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 big quake is coming. I do like the idea of college of the college football playoffs being a governing body for now and and deciding some rules. And I don't know what those rules are, but the rules are if you want to play in the playoffs. You got to play by these rules, 
And if it if you get caught tampering, um, you're out for three years. If you get there's fines, there's it can't just be a little slap on the wrist. Right. And it needs to, but it needs to be have like they have in soccer. I know that my soccer crowd loves this. If you are tampering or you you go over a certain rule, you can't go in the uh, college football playoffs for three years or whatever it may be. Yeah, uh, if you're gonna have when you do put in some rules, and they will, um, and and quite frankly, there may have to be a player representative or a committee of player representatives yep. that that sign off on them. As much as we, you know, don't want to hear that, it may come to that, um, because we just don't want to see a union that you know somebody gets powerful and like a lot of unions, not all, but it's like a lot of unions do the union chief becomes sometimes doesn't even uh, advocate for what's best for the people that he represents. It's what's best for me. Right. Um, but anyway, um, when they do put, put those rules in place that you're talking about and they will, you're exactly right. It can't be if A&M has guys working for Warren Gilbert and they leave work early and say that they worked the whole day and then therefore a and m has three or four guys that can't play and you can't play you can't be on tv and you can't play for a, a championship you can't even go postseason but if you know you can't have that and then say a few years later now if oklahoma has guys right, right, right. that are being paid by big red imports it's their star quarterback and this this but we're gonna uh we're gonna uh dock you two scholarships over two years. So you're going to have to say the punishment is going to be significant and for it's everyone. going to be for everybody. Absolutely. Hey, Coach, big shooter here. You just mentioned the competitive grit, but we've also heard you talk about the <laughs> desperation to win that you've tried to instill in this team. Now that they're having some success and you've won four series in a row, how do you and your coaching staff go about keeping that desperation at an all-time high, week in, week out, game in, game out. Yeah, it's a constant reminder for me, that's for sure. Um, it's easy for a anybody to get complacent, especially a younger player. Um, but I think part of uh, I think part of um, one of our strengths is, is the experience of of the transfers, guys like Palish, guys like Micah Dallas, guys guys like. Um, uh, Claude, who have, you know, been in a postseason, they understand that every single game has value. Uh, and and kind of like my opinion on college football, right? The, we, we are actually, we're actually in the playoffs right now, you know, um, because every, because, because every single game has so much value on making the SEC tournament or, or, um, giving yourself a chance to play in a regional uh, or, you know, anything beyond that. So the value of playing in at Vanderbilt and the value of playing at home against Incarnate Word or UTA still has incredible value. And it, and if you, if you say you want one thing, you better, your, your, your habits and, and how you perform better reflect it or there, or, or there isn't going to be those things at the end of the season. So that, at least that's my method. So, We'll see where it leads us. Uh, I do want to turn my attention to Michael Dallas and uh, how important it is to get him back on track. Yeah, no doubt about it. I think the thing you got to remember, you know, and, and and not just fans or you guys or or it, it, it's it, it's myself too because we all get frustrated. We all want him to pitch better. We want Rudis or Prager. We want them all to pitch better. No, nobody wants it more than Micah Dallas, you know, the old, what's the poem, the man in the arena, right? I mean, he, he's the one that's out there standing in front of everybody. And when he, you know, when he, when it, when it doesn't go well, it, it, it's, it's no more disappointing or embarrassing for him than it is anybody else. So it, the way I look at it is Micah Dallas is, he has track record and that's something you can depend on. Um, you can't just, not work on the things that he's not doing a good job at. You have to keep working. Um, but the fact that his last couple starts haven't been up to par just means to me that he's good. He, he's due for a great one. And, and that's all that it's going to take is one, 
one great, you know, two or three inning stretch to get him going. Um, I honestly thought we were off to that against Vanderbilt. The first two hitters he faced were outstanding. I think they were two punch outs, but I know the stuff was really good. Um, and then he got behind in the count. They they gave Spencer Jones a green light. He had a homer, and next guy ambushed the first pitch fastball, home run. And then I think and then from that point forward, it's sometimes confidence. So um, we're going to keep running him out there, uh, at, you know, whether it be in the second game or the third game. I haven't really – I was out of town yesterday. I haven't – we're going to sit down with Coach Yeski this morning. But, um, but yeah, he's uh, – He's a massive part of, of what we're trying to do in, in any role. And and I think it's just mainly it's just fastball command. And, uh, and um, you know, again, in today's college baseball, there's no hiding. You look at Chris Cortez uh, beginning of the season till now, um, there's no you, – you can't hide your flaws. And we, we, we are able to expose those to other teams, and other teams have the same information on us. So it's a – it's a compensate and adjust game all the time. Coach, I heard you say that you guys haven't really figured out whether you're going to run Mike Dallas out there on Saturday versus Sunday. So if you were to decide to let him wait and pitch game three, do you have an idea of who you would actually go to on Saturday afternoon against South Carolina? You know, I just threw that out there only because it's something that's been going through my mind. I, had, I went to visit my children yesterday in Fort Worth, so I drove a, <laughs> at a, about a two-hour and 45-minute drive each direction with a lot of things on my mind. Um, South Carolina, I don't know if they've announced the pitching rotation yet, but I think they've been pitching a little bit off the last couple of weeks. In other words, they're throwing the best guys, or at least the guys with the best numbers, uh, in the second and third game. So. We're not, I mean, Detmer's going to pitch the first game for us. Uh, we can't afford to do it any other way. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we could maybe throw Rudis or somebody different in that middle game. It'll probably be Micah. Uh, I've, I've gotten some questions, and, and obviously the way Menifee has pitched, uh, the fact that he threw 93 pitches. Uh, he, yet, uh, Tuesday night he told me it's the most number of pitches he's thrown since his junior year of high school. Um, you know, Menifee could, could be, you know, natural thought would be to maybe take a look at that, but there's also um, there's value in following somebody, right? I, I guess that's why the, the Rays started the whole opener thing. Um, there's value in that. There's there's value in not, you know, when, when you start, the other team gets a lot more time to prepare for you um, with all the different tools that we have now, so I'm not quite sure yet. I want to break down. I watched South Carolina play last night against North Carolina a and I'm, I'm headed in the office right now. I'll spend the next three or four hours just watching their hitters, and we'll just kind of see what the best matchup is since we don't, we don't really have a, you know, somebody other than Detmer right now. But more than likely it'll be Micah because I, I believe in Micah, and uh, I think he'll do great. I, I want to ask you about – Greg Sankey and uh, the Pac-12 commissioner sure. moving, uh, going to Washington to speak about NIL and see if they can get some help out there. Um, there are a couple different storylines coming out of that, but what, what I take from it is I think there's going to be change because when you have coaches outwardly talking about it, administrators and now commissioners all trying to get some help to fix what's already out of the, the tube, I don't know how change is going to happen, but I feel like change will happen here in the next year or so. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I'll be honest, you know, even in my own coverage, I think, you know, over the last probably two or three weeks, you know, I feel like I've gotten a little whiny. I've gotten a little, we can't keep going like this. And I think probably about four or five days ago, I, it kind of hit me is that, you know what, all of the, what strikes me, David, is this, all of the people that it benefits the most, that the current system benefits the most are speaking out against the current system. So you know it's not sustainable or what's best for the sport of not just college football, but college basketball as well. When Dabo Sweeney, Nick Saban, John Calipari, Coach K at the Final Four are all saying we can't keep going on like this. And so, you know, again, you know, for people who either listen to my podcast or heard me on this show and, and say, Torres, all you're doing is yelling and screaming without solutions. I think people, you know, are probably accurately depicting me in that form. But seeing Greg Sankey, the guy who obviously runs the most powerful entity in college sports, seeing him spearhead this, I think that's that to me is a good sign 
because that means that he is here. You know, at the end of the day, we got to remember Greg Sankey's job is to do what's best for the, you know, soon to be whatever it is, 16 teams in the SEC. And he's hearing from his coaches. He's hearing from Nick Saban. He's hearing from John Calipari. He's hearing from Jimbo Fisher, who has been very outspoken about he doesn't like the, the way that NIL is going. Um, I take this as nothing but a positive. Um, you know, I, I'm not smart enough to know how this all comes together, but I do think we need federal oversight. I do think we need one universal law. You know, I had a lawyer on my podcast this week, Dan Lust. If you've never had him before, he's great. Um, but, but, you know, he kind of analogized it to the drinking age. Like at some point, you know, there were certain states that the drinking age was 18, then it was 21. And you had people going across state lines to drink. And then there's all sorts of unintended consequences. At some point, the federal government, you know, got on the same page, said, look, we're going to make this across the board 21, um, not analogizing drinking and driving and all that to college sports. But I think it's clear that the powers that be are starting to realize we need something universal. Let's make this happen. Uh, and I think we'll get there at some point. Again, I'm not smart enough to know what the time frame is. But when the most important people in our sport are saying, like, this can't go on like this, that really struck me over the last couple of days. All right, Aaron, what's going to happen with Jordan Addison? Is it a foregone conclusion it's going to be USC, or do you, do you see something else popping up? And what do you think about this whole deal with he and, Pete and Pitt? Well, first of all, you know, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion at all. I mean, I, I, I'm based, you know, I live in Pasadena, California. I don't know if you know this, but Bryce Young grew up in Pasadena, California, probably a couple miles from where I'm sitting right now. And supposedly they're best friends and they're working out. I thought Caleb Williams was the guy that had the relationship, right? I mean, that was the whole conversation. Well, you know, I mean, the USC staff had nothing to do with it. Well, Caleb Williams and, and Jordan Edison are just best buds from the D.C. area. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm pretty sure USC probably had something to do uh, with Jordan Edison entering the portal. But, you know, I think this, this what I'm talking about right now kind of speaks to the fact that we can't keep going on the way that we're going on. And so – um, you know, one, obviously, you know, I think you and I, and, and I think most people that cover this stuff, I think we're all on the same page. If a player isn't happy uh, where they are, you know, they should be able to go somewhere else. You know, if a player uh, can make more money, they should. And if, if, if that's what they're interested in doing, or if that's a reason to leave a school, then, then so be it. Um, you know, I also don't think, you know, I don't think it's healthy for, for tampering. I actually saw, you know, Billy, your, your boss, you know, Tex Ags, he was one of the first people Saturday morning. I saw him say, you know, this is one of the few things that the NCAA actually can regulate uh, without getting pushed back from, you know, the law, you know, from the, the, the legalities of it and they're not doing it. And so, you know, I think whether it's tampering, I think whether it's players essentially, you know, for lack of a better term, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but extorting their schools, you know, going into the portal just to sweeten the NIL deal. Those are the elements that I don't think can go on as they are. And I think we've seen some of the worst of those elements with Jordan Addison, with the Isaiah Wong deal, the, the basketball player from Miami over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I'm hopeful that, that with some federal oversight, with some tinkering with the smartest people in our sport led by Greg Sankey, we come to some sort of way to get this a little bit more under control. And I'll tell you this, waking up today, seeing that story about Greg Sankey and the, uh, pre, uh, the commissioner of the Pac-12 going to D.C., I feel better about kind of where we are than I have in, in really quite a long time, honestly. All what right. was on your mind, Matt Brownie? My, what's on my, it was the draft. Okay. I enjoyed the draft. I liked the draft. I thought I think the draft went exactly kind of what we thought it was going to do. I thought we kind of figured that Kenyon might go in the first round. And um, I, I think the Steelers got an absolute steal with Leal. And what, they get him in the third? I mean, that, I, I really think he's going to be a, a beast. I mean, we the proof is in the pudding. You see it on the field. He played he, – he dominated in the SEC. So, uh, I don't know why he fell. I know we've talked about – our, our theories as to why he fell, but I think they got a steal there. I think we you called Clemens being drafted, yeah, uh, probably a little later than what we, we what we thought he I, might. I but. had heard potentially he had the, second. But. He had the opposite reaction of Leal is what happened. Yeah, it's the same thing that happens in every NFL draft. They watch him play football and they're like, man, that guy's good. Yeah, and then they watch him run. He's like, well, he's not quite fast enough for end. No, he's not quite fast enough for end, but he's a little too small for tackle. So we're gonna drop him down around and. At the end of the day, he can play football. Yeah. Well, whatever he weighs, whatever he, he runs, he plays football. And then we and had, Clemens yeah. is still a good football player, not the same as Leal. And he runs fast and looks good with his shirt off and this, that, and the other. And so he's climbing for all the reasons that Leal's falling. It's, it's That's what happens in every draft. It is. It's silly. I, I, but, again, uh, I mean, those late-round picks are – 
can can become absolute diamonds in the rough, you know. I mean, heck, Tom Brady went in sixth. Tony Romo never got drafted, things yep. like that. So, uh, I think Spiller is going to be a good pro. I really do. I mean, I think, I unfortunately, running backs are just not. It's a phenomenal fit where he's at with Eckler. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's what's really going to kind of give him even more of a springboard. I, I think he's going to be a really good pro, but I think – like starting in that situation is fantastic for him. And, and so my thoughts on on it come back to kind of what we talked about last week is that you look at it, you look at the teams that we're chasing, the teams that we're trying to be like or we're trying to get in that echelon of, right? And I think we're on the we're on the right track. The Bama's, the Ohio States, the Georgias. I mean, you can see the kind of talent there that they're that they're getting drafted, and I think we're on that same path. I think this was a good kind of start, you know. To uh, uh, you know, Jimbo hasn't had a draft quite like this yet, and so. Um, and it does. We had and, and we had a lot more talent that didn't get drafted that that probably could have. Yeah. Uh, Weidemeyer, uh, that's, that was a weird one. I mean, that guy was second, you know, second best tight end in, in in the nation. I really last don't year. think I don't really don't year think Weidemeyer not getting drafted is weird. We this has been beat to death, and I I, I didn't think he was going to get drafted. Now I, th- I think. Did you, you think had, that during the season or you're before? Saying, I'm talking about before la- before this past. Yeah, before season. the season, I thought he was like a, a one two round kind of guy. That's yeah. why. Yeah, that's and why I said. Then I watched why. him play football. You know, you know just watch, watch him, play him play football, football. right? And then but, he ran slow. But what? You, but what you hang your? <laughs> it doesn't matter what he ran after how he played this year. Yeah. Um, a lot of drops. But it's like. I think that what you hang your hat on with this draft class is the fact that it's not just who you got drafted or where they got drafted. Everybody that was eligible went somewhere. Oh yeah, that that that's a that's a big statement that sometimes people don't think about so much because all we focus is on the draft picks. And I know that not everything's going to pan out when you sign as an undrafted free agent. I get that, but the fact that everybody that declared now has at least a shot at a job, mm-hmm. and so I, you know you're developing the depth of the talent as well. And next year's draft's weird for me because I look up and down the roster, and I'm like. I have a lot of guys that might just stick around, though. Like, yeah, I mean, we know. only have 11 seniors. That's what Jimbo said. Yeah. We only have 11 yeah. seniors on the whole roster. And so next year's draft might might not and be. I'm, might I'm not 100% right. with you, what you were saying earlier, like between NIL and, and his track career, like, hey, A-Chain, like, stick around. Man. Maybe one more year. Maybe stick around another year. If he, doesn't, you know, if he doesn't get the kind of wear and tear that back sometimes get, they're like, man, I got to get to the league. Yeah. You know, it's a short, it was like 2.8 years is the lifespan of a running back in the NFL. It's not, it's not very long. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it's. <laughs> I am the worst at this. Like I can, I can, you cannot possibly have somebody who's worse at doing this rewind than I am. I want that on the video. Like it's not possible. I, I want am that terrible on the at video. This. But you can tell people what to do after the video. Like subscribe, comment, comment, and share. And if you share, that's a good one. If you think you are better at doing the fan show than these three guys, bring it. What I want you to do is text us on the AMB text line. If you don't know that number, I can't help you. You can be better than me at the rewind, but not but, the fan show. Well, if you, well, if you don't know the number. Then you probably shouldn't be on the fan show. Exactly. Makes a good point, but it does start with a nine seven nine six nine three eleven fifty. That's the AMB text line. So if you do tell us you want to be a part of the fan show, we're going to give you a tryout. Thanks so much for watching. It is Tech Sags Rewind.